John Gibson was the manager of the Elko Camera Shop on uh, West Jefferson Boulevard in Oak Cliff. Uh, he said he, he told the Warren Commission he usually went to the Texas Theater every Friday about 1 p.m. He even had his own seat. He'd seat, sit in the same place every time. In his testimony, you see that he knew Butch, Barrow, Butch Burroughs, who worked at the theater by Butch's first name, called him Butch, and he witnessed Oswald's arrest. Now here I got this uh, from his Warren Commission testimony, and he's answering a question here. Well, I don't believe they really headed for him, he means Oswald. I believe they just started down through the theater. From what the boy told me, Johnny Pardis told me he followed him into the theater and he went upstairs and I believe this is why all the policemen went upstairs. Upstairs would be to the balcony. So Johnny Pardis is a name that appears nowhere else in all of the evidence. And if you look in the 1961 Dallas Directory, which is the one I have access to, there is no Pardis in there. Not a single person by the name of Pardis is listed in the 1961 Dallas Directory. It's not a very common name, apparently. And if you just Google Johnny Pardis, uh, you won't get any Johnny Pardis except this one. The only thing that comes up is the testimony of John Gibson to the Warren Commission. So apparently the only Johnny Pardis that exists in the world exists in the testimony of John Gibson. And maybe the reason we don't know who Johnny Pardis is is that Joseph Ball of the Warren Commission didn't catch that coming by. He didn't follow up and say, who's Johnny Pardis? Uh, but here you have the witness, John Gibson, saying that Johnny Pardis followed Oswald into the theater. So you would think that Joe Ball would be on the ball and wonder who this is. But it doesn't matter, because there is no Johnny Pardis anyway, somehow. But of course, there is a Johnny Brewer. Johnny, when was the first time you saw Lee Harvey Oswald? Uh, saw him at Friday afternoon, November 22nd. He walked into the lobby of my store. How far in did he walk out there, John? Well, uh, just a few feet. He was standing right about where those tennis shoes are right there, just uh, about five feet from the door there. What made you suspicious of this man who walked into the lobby? Well, right after uh, the president had been shot, they broadcast a description on the radio of this man, of 5'8", 5'9", 150 pounds, and this Oswald matched the description, and well, just a few minutes before he walked into the lobby, on the radio they had a bulletin that an officer had been shot here in Oak Cliff. And he walked in, he matched the description. Looked scared, just the way he stood there. You were standing right here behind the standing counter? Standing right here behind the counter listening to the radio. And uh, where did he walk to? How far well, into the lobby did he come? He walked right into the right-hand side of the lobby there, just a few feet from the door, and stood there looking in at the shoes there. Were there a lot of police cars in yeah, the area? Yeah, there was uh, a lot of police cars. Uh, there were some cars coming up Jefferson Street. They made that U-turn there and went back down Jefferson, and when they did, Oswald turned and walked up to the theater. Yeah, that's Johnny Brewer. We all know him. Sounds like he's telling the truth. Now, as we all know, Johnny Brewer, according to the official story, followed Oswald into the Texas theater. He talked to Julia Postal before he went in. So is Johnny Pardis actually Johnny Brewer? To me, it seems very unlikely that anybody would mistake uh, the name Pardis for Brewer. They don't sound much alike. And if you are a regular at the theater and you know the guy, uh, you're, you're, you're going to why would you say Pardis? It's not even a name, apparently. So, to me, this seems to be a curious mistake. 
And if you notice, Johnny Brewer's name does not appear in any of the documents before December 4th. This is almost two weeks after the assassination, and that's the first appearance of Johnny Brewer in the documents, in the uh, affidavit sworn out here by Julia Postal. And Brewer himself doesn't make any statement on the record until December 6th. Two weeks after the assassination is the first time we hear from Johnny Brewer in the documents. And Butch Burroughs, uh, the employee at the theater, the only one we are told about anyway, other than Julia Postal, uh, he was not questioned about Johnny Brewer. And here I'm spelling Burroughs' name wrong, but I guess I'm too lazy to fix it. It's really O-U-G-H-S at the end. So Johnny Brewer and the only corroboration for him actually being there, Julia Postal, neither one of them appear in the documents until about two weeks after the assassination. To me, this suggests the possibility that for some reason, Johnny Brewer was switched in for Johnny Pardis, whoever Johnny Pardis may be. Now, the person who did what Johnny Brewer said he did does appear in the evidence prior to the Julia Postal statement, here in this December 2nd statement from police officer Ray Hawkins. His name is not given, but it does say, as I've underlined here, there was a white male at the door who said that he was the manager of the shoe store next door. So I think it's pretty clear that we do have a shoe store manager, and uh, but I think he might, he might not be Johnny Brewer. And to go by the 1961 directory, we, we can see that we have five shoe stores in the immediate vicinity. And of these five, Johnny Brewer's is the furthest one away, to judge by the street numbers anyway. I don't have photographic coverage of everything. But to judge by the street numbers, the closest shop to the Texas Theater is the McCann Tom's, or Thomas McCann Shoes, or McCann Thomas Shoes, whatever it is. That one probably is across the street, to judge by the number. But you've got one at uh, down at the bottom there, Paul's Shoe Store, that's uh, closer to the Texas Theater. The Texas Theater is 231 West Jefferson. Paul's Shoe Store is 241 West Jefferson, and Johnny Brewer's is 213 West Jefferson. So we've got four other shoe stores here that could have supplied a manager by a different name than Johnny Brewer, one that would correspond somehow to Johnny Pardis. And if you notice on here, Paul's Shoe Store is adjacent to the Elko Camera Store, where John Gibson comes from, and John Gibson is the one who named Johnny Partis. So I think we might have the best candidate here is Paul's Shoe Store. It's on the same side of the street as the Texas Theater. It's the nearest shoe store on that side of the street to the Texas Theater. And it's right next to Elko Camera, which is where uh, John Gibson comes from. And John Gibson has named the, uh, the presumed shoe store manager as Johnny Partis. Now, as I've already said, there is no Pardis in the directory in Dallas or anywhere else in the world, apparently. But there is a Bardis with a B instead of a P, and that would be an easy mistake to make, whether you wanted to make it uh, intentionally or unintentionally. The B could very easily be uh, what the P is. That is, it could very easily be Bardis, and that would be understandable. And there happens to be a John N. Bartis in the phone book. Now, the problem with it being this Bartis here is that uh, he is already the department manager at Jimmy Clark's Super Save Market uh, in 1961. He might become a shoe store manager, but he also has a son by the name of Nick, who is a, an office assistant at Panama Beaver Carbon Company. So, I think Nick 
might somehow be Johnny Pardis. And this is Nick Bardis. He would have been uh, 22 years old at the time of the assassination. You might think that's kind of young to be managing a camera store, but Johnny Brewer was managing a shoe store, and he's the same age. Probably, almost certainly, his middle name is John because his father's name was John and he's Nick J. His father was John N., probably John Nick Bardis. Uh, so, and often people are called by their middle names. And if the father, uh, well, for whatever, I can only speculate so far, but I think it's reasonable to think that he could have been called Johnny, even though his first name is Nick. So he's the right age. And I, I think that probably he was the, the shoe store manager at Paul's shoe, uh, the Paul shoe store, where, uh, which is right next to Elko Camera, which is where John Gibson was. So John Gibson would know Nick Bartis. And uh, I don't know why the Warren Commission talked to Gibson at all. It seems kind of dangerous to bring Gibson into it if he knows the guy, the real shoe store salesman, was in uh, the Texas theater. But I think that's what we have here. I think Nick Bardis was Johnny Pardis, that he actually was the shoe store guy who got his way into the evidence, even with, if not with his actual name. He was still mentioned as being there, so they had to have a shoe store guy. But for some reason, I think Nick Bardis didn't work out. Maybe he was too honest to participate in such a thing. And I think they brought in Johnny Brewer to do the job, and that's why we don't hear from Johnny Brewer until two weeks after the assassination. They had to get the story straight with everybody before they presented it to us. So I think that Nick Bardis is the shoe store manager that's talked about in the evidence, and that Johnny Brewer and Julia Postal were somehow persuaded to lie about it, Julia Postal did seem to be uh, uptight about this incident. Uh, I forget the details of that. And Johnny Brewer was given the plum job of managing the uh, downtown store. You were made manager of the Hardy's downtown shoe store? Yes, sir. It was an April Fool's. I thought they were firing me, but it turned out they weren't. <clears throat> Did he call you yesterday to tell you? Day before yesterday and told me to get ready for an audit that I would be going to town if I wanted it. And I said yes. Would this be considered a promotion? A better store, more volume, and make more money? It would be considered a promotion. Any children at all, Mr. Brewer? No. So Johnny Brewer, after the assassination two days before his Warren Commission testimony, was given the plum job at the plum store, the top job for a manager probably, uh, on the local level of a shoe store, more money, and he doesn't even have a family to support. Why would he lie? Well, right after uh, the president was shot, they broadcast inscription on the radio of this man of 5'8", 5'9", 150 pounds. And this Oswald matched the description. And well, just a few minutes before he walked into the lobby, on the radio they had a bulletin that a officer had been shot here in Oak Cliff. And he walked in, he matched the description. 